comfort to be able to say with assurance it is well with my soul. You know, I, I'm one of those people, I love this weather, okay? I love the rain. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think of what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, and he says, the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, it does not return um, there, but waters the earth that it might bring forth the bud. And so is my word that goes forth from my mouth and it will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish that which I have sent it to accomplish. And that's what we're here to do this morning. We want to sow the word into our hearts. So if you want to turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 6. Now, remember what's been happening so far. We've seen God's mathematics at work. We've seen him adding to the church and multiplying to the church. We've even seen him subtracting from the church. But the one thing that we know that God does not do is that he does not divide. But when we get to chapter 6, we're going to see some division. But first let me tell you a story about four uh, church leaders. They, they got together and they said, you know, let's go to a, a conference together as church elders. And so they went and it happened to be that the theme of the conference was all about accountability and being real with each other and bearing our souls and confessing our sins to one another. And so sure enough, they got to their coffee break and as they were sitting around this wee table, things started to get deep. And uh, one of them says, you know, brothers, I need to tell you, I've been struggling. I have a problem with drinking. He says, I know the church would be shocked if they find out. I preach against it. I, 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 I say all the right things, but I have this innate burden to have a drink. And I know that whenever I have a drink, it's never just a drink. I have a problem. And they're all very sympathetic and reassuring. And the second one says, you know, I need to tell you, I, I have a problem, but no drinking. My, my problem is gambling. I have lost so much money in gambling situations that I might lose the house. The third one hung his head and says, you know, I don't have a problem with alcohol or gambling, but my finances are a mess. I have a real problem being honest with the tax man. Because when it comes down to being honest, I, I fudge the numbers when it comes to expenses and what, what I've done and, and write offs and I kind of make a lot of exceptions to rules and bend the rules and maybe break a few. I've cheated the tax man. The fourth guy was very quiet this whole time. And the three of them all kind of just looked at him as if to say, Your turn. He says, you know, I don't have a problem with drinking. I don't have a problem with gambling. I am very honest with my family. And says, that's not a problem whatsoever. I do have one vice, though. My big vice, my big problem is gossip. And I got to tell you, I can't wait for this conference to be able to go and tell everyone about you. Story. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. No church is perfect. No church leader is perfect there is only a perfect god with a perfect son who gives perfect salvation to imperfect people and that must be very thankful for the book of acts it gives an honest record of the initial weeks months and years of the of church history of how it unfolds and who are involved in that process and i'm thankful that it doesn't pull any punches it gives us very real accounts of personalities and it tells you straight up who these people were what their problems were where they excelled where they failed the church has never ever had perfect people in it we read in acts already about judas iscariot having killed himself we've dealt with ananias and sapphira in chapter 15, we're going to see Paul and Barnabas fall out with each other and the contention be so sharp between them that they have to be separated. They can't work with each other. They've fallen out with each other so badly. So it's very honest and there's comfort in that, I think. We're to learn from the early church. We're never supposed to idolize it. 
We're never meant to put it up on such a pedestal that we think we need to get back to it because it was, wasn't perfect. But now we, we, we've got a, a unique problem here in Acts 6. A specific complaint about one group of people against another and it's going to bring division in the church. It's another tactic of the devil in the face of the church growing so quickly. He's going after the message. He's going after the messengers. Now he's going after the people in the pews, as it were. Going to create discontent. Going to create uh, discomfort. He's going to rob people of their unity. Let's make them out to be inconsistent with this message of love, right? Sounds familiar. It happens all the time in churches now. People start agitating between each other, talking to each other. If you've ever done any camping, you'll know this truth that when you turn the lights on, the bugs come, right? And whenever the light of the gospel shines brightly, Satan will make sure that all the creepy crawlies start coming out and things start to bug you. Things will start to get uncomfortable, uneasy, less than perfect, less than idealistic, and he'll want to make sure that little things start to bug you and start to impact you whenever you begin to shine for Christ. And he'll do it all to either oppress you, distract you, or divide you. It tends to be all of Satan's tactics or one of those three. He'll oppress you, he'll distract you, or he'll divide you. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, we are not ignorant of his devices. He will always employ one of those tactics. And we see it in, in division here. Whenever there is a church that is complaining, backbiting, quarreling, disagreeing, or simply hurting, or off in a corner huffing and say, well, I'm not going to talk to them. I'm not going to do this because they're like that. All you find is they become ineffective and the devil gets a foothold. So let's get into this. Uh, verse 1, Acts 6. Now in these days, okay, when everything's going really well and growing, uh, the, disi uh, the disciples were increasing in number. A complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Okay, so big picture, what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit is going to fix this problem by putting some new structures in place. Um, the early church starts to get more organized, more structures in place. And I say that because the end thing at the moment is to say, oh, I don't believe in organized religion. Right? Whatever that means. I mean, like they don't believe in it. Like they don't believe churches exist or they don't, they'd rather have their religion to be disorganized. I, I don't know. It seems very strange to me. But some people are that way inclined. They would rather just make it up as they go along. And it doesn't matter if it contradicts. It doesn't matter if it doesn't all make sense. As long as they can find something that makes sense to them in that moment, then it's fine. Others might say, look, as soon as you put structures in place, you quench the Holy Spirit. That's not good. Let's not do that. But when you read your Bibles, you'll see that our God is a creator. God, a designer, an architect. Look at creation. Everything has its place. There are rules. That's why we have things like science, you know, chemistry, biology, physics, where we understand how the world works as we explore the rules of why things happen the way they happen in a predictable manner. It's because it's organized by a creator. Genesis 6, Noah was given the dimensions of the ark that he had to build. In Numbers 2, the children of Israel were told to come in specific formations around the tabernacle. Throughout the Bible, we have genealogies and family trees, records of the size of the tribes and where their territory stretched to. God likes things to be organized, structured. Paul even goes on to tell the church, look, everything must be done orderly. We observe an orderly universe. That should be reflected in our worship. There should be order and ardor. <coughs> Passion and enthusiasm, but structures and clear thinking. You know, the church in Acts started with 120 people in an upper room. It is very much taking each day as it came. Everything flowed very easily. It was new. It was exciting. It was adventurous. But as it grew with the church changing, it needed to reorganize to make sure it was doing everything it was called by God to do. 
And so here we read of a demand into a demand to change how they were doing things. The problem came when it was growing so fast, and I know, all right, you hear, oh, they're growing so fast, it must be so terrible for them, right? You know, we roll our eyes, it must be nice having those problems. <clears throat> Wish we had those problems. Yeah, good problems, but they're still problems. They still had to be dealt with. And people might think that, you know, if their church grows too quickly, that, that they'll get neglected, that people will just become faces in a crowd, that, that the church that, that, that took such an interest in them will not be able to keep such an interest in them. And that can be a problem. I could imagine some of those 120 people in the upper room murmuring to each other, it's not like it used to be. You know, if I don't get there really early, somebody will sit in my seat. Because, you know, that's always the worst thing that can happen in a church, isn't it? Somebody sits in your seat. Or some people might say, you know, I liked it better whenever I knew everyone. That can be a problem when a church grows too quickly. Another problem in quick growth, like in, we see in Acts, is whenever the same small group of leaders are expected to work at the same level of efficiency, but on a very different scale. You had a dozen leaders for 120 people. Suddenly having a dozen leaders for thousands and thousands of people. That's going to create problems. And I love this story because the apostles fix it by delegating. They address the problem head on, but they don't take personal responsibility for it on top of their other duties. They're going to look to bring other people in. So let's look at the problem. First one, a complaint by the Hellenists against the Hebrews over the widows being neglected. Now, remember the Sadducees and the people who they've been persecuting, the leaders? are the ones in control of the economy in Jerusalem, right? They run the temple. So people are being made redundant, and so they are now then trying to figure out uh, ways in the church to make sure that people have a daily food distribution, people make sure that they have what they need. And it seems like there's one group of widows that are being neglected, or one group that are getting preferential treatment over another group. See, there's two categories of Jew. There was the Hebrew, who were the local Aramaic speakers. They didn't need Bible translations. They used the original text, you know, if you don't mind. They're very proud of that. They were very uh, uh, distinguished in that fact. The Hellenists were, were part of the group called the Diaspora, okay? The, the, the um, largely Greek-speaking, they, they maybe, for whatever reason, kind of came from all different parts of the outside of Israel, scarred on the, the world for different reasons, some by choice, some because of the slave trade from, from the Roman invasion. Maybe generations later, their descendants returned to Jerusalem. But whenever they did, they, they found themselves culturally very different from the other Jews, linguistically very different from the other Jews. But they found community with others who'd been through the same journey as them. And so you have the Hebrews and you have the Hellenists, the Aramaic speaking Jews and the Greek speaking Jews. Both Jews, both in Jerusalem, but both with their own separate language, cultures, synagogues, and all the rest of them. So there was always a them and us thing going on in Jerusalem. Which, you know, you look at and go, that's crazy. Why can't this all get on together? You know what I mean? Could you imagine a big city? I don't know, take. Belfast, for example, right? Could you imagine two communities existing, struggling to get along with each other because they've got different views on how to worship and how to do it right? That's silly, isn't it? That would never happen. But now they're called together into one church, into one fellowship. Both are Messianic Jews, both are believers in Jesus, but still two very different backgrounds. Used to being apart, used to separated existences, but now they're in one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one church. And whenever you've got different people coming into one group, you're going to have differences of opinion, differences of perspective. And this is what happens. And it causes problems. Perhaps they were thinking the church is so big that they don't care about me anymore. 
or at least they're looking at the leadership and saying, you're not fit for purpose anymore. Things aren't going the way they should be going. So there's a problem. Let's go on. Uh, so the 12 apostles summoned the disciples together and they noticed the word disciples. It's the very first time that word is used in the book of Acts and it's to a different group. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the disciples were the 12 guys. Right? They followed Jesus. And that was the leadership structure. You had Jesus and then you had the 12. But when Jesus goes, those 12 disciples become the 12 apostles and those apostles then take on different followers, disciples. Okay, so the, the, the uh, system started to change, but these disciples are going to be the next generation of leaders. This is how they train people up. And so the apostles say, look, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. We're too busy to personally oversee this thing every single day. We don't want to leave the word of God to serve tables. Now, the tables do need served. They recognize that. They're just saying they can't be the ones doing it every day. So it seems that the apostles are conceding that there is a problem, or at least the issue needs more governance. You know, can, can we agree that sometimes whenever you talk a thing to death, it can do more harm than good? Think about it, you perceive something to be unfair, so you ask the person beside you, hey, do you think this is right? Do you think, I'm not sure about that, I don't think that's right. And, and so you start to ask. And then maybe someone else says, well, look, they disagree, but do you see what I'm saying? Do you hear what I'm hearing? Do you think the same as me? And what happens is you start spreading these kind of negative thoughts, these negative uh, bad seeds, bad words, bad ideas, inferior motives. Maybe they're not doing the right thing for the right reason. And suddenly more and more people are looking for faults and they're coming to things more critically. Because you brought it to their attention. People get defensive. Oh, those hellness, they're just bitter. They're just stirring. Of course it's fair. How dare you accuse me of not looking after everyone fairly? Is what the helmets are doing. They're either saying the people doing the discipline are either incompetent or they're corrupt. So you're going to get defensive. But you know, God hates that. And I don't mean he just doesn't like it. The Bible tells us he hates it. In Proverbs 6, there's a list of seven things that God hates. Now, don't do it now, but later go look at Proverbs 6 and study the seven things that God hates. You'll learn a lot. It says, six things the Lord hates, yea, seven are an abomination to him. And last on the list, he says, those who sow discord among the brethren. God hates that. So there may have been a problem. But they made the problem worse by murmuring and complaining. It was causing division so verse 3 therefore brothers uh, pick out from among you seven men of good repute full of wisdom and wisdom um, full of the spirit and of wisdom whom we will appoint to this duty get a team organized we'll put our stamp of approval on it and then you just can get on with it we'll sign it off just go and sort it out and verse 4 we'll devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word Stuff like this that makes us see that the guys have really matured. Remember whenever Jesus was feeding the 5,000? What was their solution? The solution to the problem of the people complaining about they weren't getting food to eat. Well, send them away. <laughs> Let them go home, all right? If, if, you're, if you're causing complaint, if you remember, well, just go. Nobody's keeping you here. Right? That was their solution. Or whenever the woman brought the, 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 her, uh, the Canaanite woman brought her daughter to, to them and, was, uh, and they said to Jesus, Send her away. She's crying after us. Oh, she's making so much noise, Jesus. Please send her away. This was their solution. Oh, you got a problem? Well, we don't really like problems. Go away. <laughs> problem solved. We don't have a problem anymore. And yet here you can see that they've grown. They're facing the problem head on. They're coming up with a good solution. Okay, we're not going to just send them away. We're not just going to let them go set up their own church. Or, you know, they can go form, you know, Second Jerusalem Church, you know, or Reformed Jerusalem Church, or Free Jerusalem Church, or anything like that there. No, it's like, let's fix this issue. Let's keep everyone together. Let's meet the need rather than avoiding the issue. 
but it's not going to be them meeting the need. They're not going to leave the word to serve tables. They reiterate their priorities, and I love that because it can be so tempting to do that. What's immediate, what's urgent, what's loud and happening right now can so often replace what's important. It happens in friendships. Whenever you know, life gets busy and you suddenly realize it's been weeks, it's been months since we've really had a good conversation and people grow apart. It happens in marriages. You end up running after kids to try and keep up with the demands and there's guitar lessons or rugby or there's football or there's this and there's that and there's stuff at the church and then there's other things and everybody's out and run and you suddenly realize that you have this empty nest and you've neglected your priority, your spice. You made a vow on your wedding day. But so many other things came in and took priority. A really important lesson in life is learning to say no to some of the busyness for the sake of your priorities. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. And sometimes it's better to say no. That's going to take me away from my priority. So I'm not going to do it. Over the years, I've seen a lot of churches get distracted and they make the, a good thing the main thing. But that means the main thing becomes a side thing. As teachers. And you know, I'm thankful for the elders and the deacons that we have here in the church. They work hard, they've got good heads on them and uh, good hearts. But you know, they've said to me specifically many a time, Jeff, your job is to prioritize the word. Focus on the teaching. Like maybe they're applying Act 6. Maybe they just don't trust me near any of the other stuff. I don't know. But one thing that I know I can never do as a pastor is the one thing I can never give up is the word. The word, the word. Preach the word, Timothy, in season, out of season. I made three promises whenever I started the church that I would work hard, that I would love the people, and I'd preach the word. They're my priorities. So the apostles say, okay, disciples, seven of you can take this task on. Now, first of all, why seven? Don't know, right? I don't know. Um, I, I think it's got to do with the model in, in uh, Judaism, okay? In Jewish society, in, in Jewish communities, public affairs were dealt with by a group of seven elders. So it was a pattern that people knew. It was a system that people were familiar with. It was a, a framework that was familiar to the people at the time. So I think maybe they just went with what they knew. Makes sense, right? But notice it's seven from among you. Don't just grab seven randomers. We want disciples, men who we as apostles have worked with, men who we as apostles have trained, who have studied with, Men we trust have trained. So even for a practical task like serving the widows, they sought out spiritual men. And while this text, in, this te text is a template for deacons and their role being distinctive to elders because one serves while the other is more spiritual, look, the call first and foremost regardless of who is serving in leadership, is that they ought to be spiritual men. They are disciples first. Go through any of the passages in Scripture where it talks about the characters and the role of elders and deacons and all the rest, but never does it ask for business admin experience. Never does it ask for someone to be handy with a set of tools. The Bible always comes back to make sure the leaders are spiritual men, that they're godly men of good character. And we get a quick breakdown here. First, they have to be of good reputation, which means they have to be about for a while. They've been observed, watched, proven, consistent. And as others have watched them, they have a good reputation. People know them, people trust them. Then it's to be full of the Spirit, regardless of any of the other qualifications. 
if you don't have this, it's, it, it's worthless, it's meaningless. To be controlled by, to be filled by, managed by the Holy Spirit. A person who is spirit-led. Are they spiritual when they're in public? And different when they're away from that? Is it authentic? Is it real? Is it genuine? Or does their passion for God switch off and on depending on who they're with and what's going on? Are they spiritual people on the surface and on the inside? Or is it just a veneer? And wisdom, look, you know what wisdom is. You can be smart but not wise. You can have a high IQ, you can have a degree, you can have several. Doesn't make you a spiritual wise person. Wisdom is the godly application of <coughs> knowledge. Can you apply biblical truths to real life situations? That's the call. Okay, let's move on. Verse 5. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. So everyone was on board. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Pam, uh, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And they sat before the apostles, and they prayed, and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Okay, so first things first. Notice all those names that I totally butchered, okay? I'm trying to read through them. They're all Greek names. They're all people from the Hellenist side of the church. What a gracious way to solve the problem. The Greeks are complaining. The issue seems valid. The complaint has merit. They're worried about favoritism. They're worried about being second class members of the church. So the ones who are now going to be in charge of the distribution will be Greek disciples. I love that. It's affirmative action, New Testament style, right? It's like, okay, look, we know you, we trust you, but so will the people who are having the issues. So you go and administer to them. Okay? It's not just a gesture, it's not just a symbol to make sure, like, well, they were just ticking a box there, so we've got a few more Greek people, and it's like, no, no, they're going to be known and trusted by the people who are feeling like their nose is out of joint. So they're the best people to go bring healing there. Verse 6, so they come before the apostles who bless them, commission them, and they let them tear on. They care. Right? The apostles care about what's happening. They approve them, they bless them, but then they leave them alone to serve. The apostles trained them up. They trust them. And so they're trusted to get on with them. Now, verse 7, notice verse 7. It is the end of the second section of Acts. Uh, verse 8 begins a whole new section. Um, we had one, the end of the first section was at the end of chapter 2. And now we've got one here, um, kind of in the middle of uh, chapter 6. It's a summary statement given by Luke. He'll do this throughout the book, okay? We'll get ones at different points. We'll be one in uh, chapter 9. Um, there's going to be another one in chapter 12, chapter 16. Kind of these blocks of, um, they kind of change the direction. Verse 7 is a summary. It ends the witness of the gospel in Jerusalem. Oh, no, sorry, no. That's a really bad word. It doesn't end the, the witness. Uh, what it does is it ends the biblical focus all on the witness and the gospel in Jerusalem. Okay? This, the, there's going to be a focus shift now to go on to other places. Remember what the whole point of the book is. The whole point of the book is going from, going to chapter 1, to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost points of the earth. Where we've done Jerusalem. We're now going to move on to see what happens in Judea and Samaria and the other parts of the world. And we're going to see that in three different parts. Okay, We're going to see it first with Stephen the martyr, with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and then with uh, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus to become Paul the apostle. So now we're into a different section. Stephen, remember the deacon that we've just met? full of grace and power again showing us his spiritual qualities was doing great wonders and signs among the people again a spiritual person in a spiritual role 
Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freemen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. Okay, so the Talmud tells us that there are about 390 synagogues in Jerusalem at this time. And the synagogue of the freemen was one of them. It was therefore ex slaves, okay? So if you had um, been under the Roman Empire or whatever other empire that maybe had been about, you come back. This was a, a church for ex slaves, for the men who were free. And so you had people from all different parts of the world coming there. But notice one place in particular is mentioned, Cilicia. Who comes from Cilicia? Saul of Tarsus. Tarsus is one of the main cities of the area of Cilicia, the province of Cilicia. So Saul of Tarsus, aka the guy who's going to become the Apostle Paul, is at this synagogue. He's there with the synagogue. He picks a fight with Stephen. And even though he isn't an ex-slave, because you go on to say, you know, I was born a Roman citizen, freeborn, and all the family ties and all the rest of it, I think because of the connection to Cilicia, and, and it felt like a flavour of home, I think that's why he belonged there. And so he's going to be there whenever Stephen speaks in the next chapter, and we'll get to that eventually, but I'm just setting up for verse 10. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So again, this is why you've got spiritual people in positions of leadership. You know, I said, well, it doesn't matter. It's just someone who's looking after the widows. But here's why it's important to have spiritual people. The criteria mentioned are repeated again. They saw the spirit and wisdom which Stephen was highlighted for. Then they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Well, no, they didn't. That's a lie. But that's what they're saying. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council and they set up false witnesses. Okay, so again, the Bible is saying it's a lie. They're telling lies about Stephen. This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Maybe that sounds a wee bit familiar. Does this not sound an awful lot like the trial of Jesus before the Sanhedrin? Where they, they, they pay people off to come and tell lies and make accusations and to twist the words. And so they come up with this threefold fabrication against Deacon Stephen. It's not anything to do with his works among the widows. They can't challenge him for his good works. They can't challenge him on his reputation, but they're going to challenge him on his theology. He's speaking against God, he's speaking against the temple, he's speaking against Moses. And that's the accusation. Now, that's going to set you up for chapter 7, because Stephen will go and speak and answer those things. But just as the Spirit was with Stephen to do signs and wonders, as it propelled him forward to be selected to minister to the widows, so the Spirit helps him in this moment. He looks up at these men who have instigated lies and repeated the lies and repeated the lies and repeated the lies. He looks up at them. I don't know if you've ever been there, but surely it's one of the hardest things in the world to sit there and hold your tongue when you know someone is telling lies about you. It's hard, isn't it? It is so hard. Stephen had never said any of these things. In fact, Stephen had said that Jesus was God, that he was the fulfillment of the law, and a better way than the religious customs that Moses brought. But they twisted that. God is, yeah, they, that Stephen is speaking against all the things that we hold dear. Now here's the thing. You can say the right thing, and you can say it with all the clarity and love that is humanly possible. But there will be some people who are always going to want to twist your words. There's always going to be people who want to take what you're going to say and make it sound like you said something that you never said. And so at this point, Stephen just doesn't speak. What happens is he shines. And I love just the last verse of this chapter. All these sat in the council looked steadfastly at him and saw his face as of an angel. 
Why is it noteworthy? Why was he so angelic? Was it because he was baby-faced? No. I think it's noteworthy because they said Stephen was speaking against God and the temple and who else? Moses. But whenever God gave Moses the covenant and he came down from Mount Sinai, what does the Bible say about Moses? That his face shone. And these Jewish leaders would have looked at Stephen and thought, oh my goodness, this is what like happened to Moses. It's happening to the guy that we know we've told lies about, that we've instigated stories about. It's happening to him. And it sounds like he's not against Moses, but rather God is making him to be like Moses. But see, whenever you're dealing with people like this, sometimes the best thing is to not say anything. What's the point? They're not going to listen. They're only going to double down on the lies. Now again, I want to emphasize, we want to explain God's truth as clearly and as accurately as we can. But there's a limit that, to what we can do sometimes. Sometimes we just have to endure the false accusations and shine. In Luke 6, verse 35, Jesus said, love your enemies and do good. Then, expecting not to get anything in return, and your reward will be great. You'll be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. In the face of false accusations, shine. And I think it suggests that there's a calmness and a serenity about Stephen. That he just had this face of an angel. He wasn't flustered. He wasn't panicking. He wasn't angry. In fact, you go forward a wee bit from Luke 6 to Luke 12, Jesus said this. And I think we see with Stephen here, there's a fulfillment of this promise. Luke 12, verse 11 and 12 says, When you're brought before the synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourself or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. And there's a fulfillment here in the promise of Jesus. Stephen is calm. He shines. Chapter 7, he will speak, and it's the longest speech in all of Acts. So he doesn't lack for something to say. But just as the Holy Spirit worked in Stephen to do signs and wonders, just as the Spirit worked in Stephen to stand out and, and be nominated to help serve the widows, so too does the Holy Spirit working through him give him a calm in the midst of a storm. This is genuinely a wonderful work of God that you can ask for and receive today. In the face of an enemy, he is at peace. And said, Lord, I believe that you can and you will give me peace and the strength that I need for this moment. Psalm 23, I will fear no evil for you are And so here's Stephen, looking out at the council, the face of an angel, peaceful, confident, radiant. He knew that he was in God's hand and he knew that God does not forsake his people. Let me just say something as we close. Stephen's a great guy, okay? A, a wonderful character for sure, a deacon with distinction, but his greatness is better measured in how closely he is identified with Christ how he is associated with the Savior. And I want you to hear something. Stephen is so identified with Jesus that they even falsely accuse him the way they falsely accused Christ. And I'm speaking to people here this morning who consider themselves a follower of Jesus, who consider themselves to be disciples, followers, learners of Christ, who are saved when we believe the good news of Jesus Christ and we become Christians, there is this invitation that we consciously identify ourselves with Christ. I am his, he is mine. I am in him, he is in me. We identify with him. I am a Christian. 
I am saved. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And Stephen, as a follower of Jesus, displayed that faith and that grace and that power of someone who is filled by the Holy Spirit. And we go, yes, who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to have all those things happen to them? All those things that were identified as requirements in the earlier verses and he showed and displayed in verse 10 are now. Yeah, that's what we want. We want those things. Who doesn't want to be known for grace and faith and wisdom and compassion? But let me say, identifying with Jesus in those things also means that we must identify with Jesus when he is falsely accused and we suffer the way he suffered. Do you remember what John 15 said? Jesus is speaking and says, if the world hates you, it's because they hated me. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember, a servant is not greater than the master. If they persecute me, they will persecute you. And Stephen is so identified with Christ. Because they hated the Savior, they hit Stephen for the exact same reason. For Stephen and for us, we can't just follow Jesus for the good things. We can't just follow him for the good times, for the good promises, for the bits that we like. We need to be okay with identifying with Jesus and following him, even when it's difficult, even when it costs, even when it means that there's going to be name calling or our words are going to get taken out of context. And things are going to get difficult because we simply are reflecting him. We need to be real about this. There is a cost to following Christ. And this is what Stephen shows us. The calm assurance to shine in the storm. Yes. I love what Paul, who ironically was probably sitting in and around this, listening to it all take place. But Saul of Tarsus would later go on to write the Philippians 3. And he says, as we follow Jesus, it's like this. First him. That I may know him. Praise God, right? We all want to know him, right? It's a good start. To know him, to know his sins forgiven, to know all that's happening, yeah. And the power of his resurrection. Oh, yes, amen, hallelujah, yes. We want the power of his resurrection. Yes, Lord. But then, this, here's how he finishes the verse, Philippians 3.10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. People don't like you because you remind them too much of Jesus. Oh, to be so identified with Christ that the world can't help but see him in me. Suddenly it feels like a very radical prayer, doesn't it? Because we are so quick to say, oh, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be Christ-like. But to be Christ-like leads to opposition. And so, yeah, we receive it all. We take it all. Yes, the great things and the hard things because of the surpassing worth of knowing him. And we say, Lord, we want to follow you. By faith, we want to consciously identify with you. Church, let him be your identity. Be so closely like him. Yes, it will bring you tremendous blessings as you love and as you forgive and as you walk in faith and power absolutely and as you bring encouragement to the people around you. But let's be straightforward. Let's be honest. It will also might bring trouble along the way. But God will be with you and God will be glorified in the midst of it. Because he lives. I can face tomorrow. 
because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living because he lives. I want to look to him and trust in him and rest in him. And yes, be identified in him as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this introduction to Stephen. It feels strange how um, someone who got asked to just help out with some of the widows in the church, who, who got asked to you know, help out just making sure people get enough sandwiches, enough bread, enough oil, enough milk, ends up being on trial. People telling lies. People spreading rumors. Lord, I wonder how many people in the church maybe started to believe the lies or started talking about him behind his back. And, and yet, Lord, your word is clear that he was faithful, that what they did was wrong, what they did was tell lies. Lord, you were not taken back by it. Lord, you saw through what was happening in other people's hearts. Lord, and your record about Stephen is true, Lord. I, I pray, perhaps there's someone in church this morning or listening online, and they've been in that situation where people have taken their words and turned on them and twisted them. Lord, may they be comforted that you see through it all. You keep a perfect record. But Lord, in the midst of the difficulty, in the midst of the hardship, Lord, may we too shine like angels. Lord, if we don't always know what to say, help us to love our enemies and to do good. To not waver, to not be brought down to their level. But rather, Lord, may we be so identified with you that it becomes part of the territory. It becomes part of doing business as a believer. That there will be some people who just won't like us. And they'll have their face set against us but Lord, that it wouldn't sway us from living for you, shining for you, speaking for you, living for you. And so Lord, we pray this in your name.